Hey guys, this is your High Fist here with another juicy topic and notes. As always, thank you to Steven Erickson for commenting on and sharing the last video. In fact, this particular video is a direct result uh, of his comments on my last one, especially the essay that he wrote on Facebook. I always pin every Erickson comment on my videos and I've done so for the last one as well. But you need to visit Erickson's Facebook page to read the main essay. So I urge you to do that. It will be worth your time. Trust me. Uh, at one point in the essay, he, he sort of really starts breathing fire. So you should read it. You will enjoy it if you haven't already. The specific issue I wanted to touch on is the observation he made uh, in that essay that he's often been pigeonholed as both a right-wing thinker and a left-wing thinker, which I found fascinating because to me, his political commentary in the series is a is a critique of precisely that labels he's he's doing his best to clarify his credentials uh, but this shouldn't be his lone burden this is why fan communities exist uh, so this is a fan's perspective on why erickson's writing is not tainted by any socio-political agenda just my perspective in fact the focus of this video is on why i think it's pointless, meaningless to decode Erickson's uh, sort of politics through his books or to put him on the left or the right because the point he's trying to make as I was saying is antithetical to that dichotomy. He's using the books to argue against fixed labels and fixed schools of thought. So when you abduct him into one political camp or another you are engaging in precisely the type of exercise that the books are telling you not to. I can totally see though why so many people are tempted to decode his politics and figure out what exactly he's trying to say to box him into a label because he touches on very deep issues that are relevant even today. It's, it's magnified by the weight of the content, not just the physical weight of the books, right? the, the thematic weight as well. Think about it. On this channel alone, we've looked at how he explores culture, sexual violence, war crimes, barbarism, mythology, oral history, military strategy, and that's just naming a few. So when a writer touches on all these things, people will read into it. Uh, people will sort of have strong opinions on those things. They might not be experts, but they will still have strong feelings about things like culture, religion, uh, sexual violence, you and I have strong beliefs when it comes to those things, right? So if, if they don't really like what you say, it's human nature, I guess, for a lot of people to dismiss you as a, as a fool from the other side, right? Which happens a lot as well. In fairness to such people, though, they do sometimes have a point. So many authors, filmmakers, artists, uh, you name it today, they're so preachy, so condescending. They talk down to you from this intellectual and moral pedestal that they think they're seated on. And I think this sickens a lot of people. However, Erickson is not one of those. It might seem to some people like he is if they cherry pick quotes or, or passages and juxtapose that with their own views. But overall, he remains one of the most objective writers when you look at the scope of what he's dealing with. I wouldn't say he sort of, he doesn't take a side because there are undertones where he does take a side and he does have a worldview, but it's certainly not a political side. It's certainly not an ideological side that Erickson seems to favor. Let's look at a few themes that justify my claim. The first, of course, which many people have discussed, is Erickson's treatment of a sensitive subject like that of empire. Those of you who are well read uh, on world history, and I'm sure all of you are, you're my subscribers after all, you will know that the issue of empire has been very rigorously debated, not just today, but throughout history. And you will also know that many Western writers these days have been criticized for either being too right-leaning or too left-leaning when they write about uh, empire. And you know what, I've got, to, I've got to agree with this assessment. Uh, I dread having to read world history or even historical fiction these days if the author's a young, upcoming 
thinker from the West, if it's a white author, so to speak, because you already know that nine out of ten times, it's either going to be some nonsense alluding to the superiority of Western civilization, or it's going to be the author going, uh, boo-hoo, wah 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 right time, evil, my ancestors are evil, now let me flog myself because of my race and atone for the sins of my ancestors as if they are the only ones with uh, evil ancestors, right? Uh, this is just my personal observation and not meant as an insult towards any specific uh, writer. I just find that most works on the subject of empire these days by Western authors tend to fall into one of these two caricatures. Once again, just my personal observation, I'm not an expert. Erickson manages to strike a middle path that very few writers have treaded on on this topic. And while this will leave objective readers very satisfied, it will upset people who already belong to an ideological position about empire. At no point does Erickson treat any empire as a noble entity, uh, sort of, uh, he always reveals the predatory nature uh, behind em imperialism. He always highlights the brutal atrocities that are committed and he demonstrates that there is no altruism behind it. However, there are also instances where he, he doesn't just trash the idea of empire. There are just as many instances where the empires in question have a genuinely civilizing effect on the lands that they conquer with both the Malazan and uh, Lethari empires, for instance. There's a structure, there's a stability that they bring, which then allow ordinary people to pursue a better standard of living. Uh, there's more on this in my Kasa versus Samardev uh, video. On the subject of empire itself, another thing I've always appreciated about the series is how Erickson's vision of empire is not a completely Western one. And this is where I once again have to go into a small uh, non-Western perspective uh, rant as usual, right? The, the conversation on empire it's always centered around questions relating to the Greeks or the Romans or the more sort of recent European colonialism. But I never got that feeling while reading this series. I never got the feeling that the writer's understanding of issues like conquest, like slavery, like uh, the rewriting of history, that Erickson's perspective on this was limited to the Western Hemisphere's experience. I never got that feeling. And as a writer, he wouldn't have been able to do this had he been trying to use the series as a backdoor to voice his own private political views. It wouldn't have happened, however subtle. It, it just wouldn't have. Because it's only when you raise questions that are universal that you can get past that trap. Erickson never explores colonialism and empire as if it was just a white man's burden or a white man's curse. If we take slavery as an example in the general discourse that you encounter today, it could be online or even in academia. I encounter so many people whose entire idea of slavery is simply European colonialists shipping African slaves to the new world. To them, that is slavery. And every conversation on slavery is centered around that, eventually brought back to something about that. But you will never find answers if you put those blinkers on. Uh, you need to understand that slavery is an institution that existed for millennia before the Western Hemisphere even had civilization. Everybody with power practiced slavery regardless of the color of their skin. If your perspective was based exclusively on what the post-medieval European colonizers did, you will never get the big picture about slavery of many different issues. Erickson is well aware of this phenomenon. In fact, even in that recent Facebook post, I think when he was when he mentioned fascism, he said, look, fascism existed before there was a word for it. Uh, and the point he was making there was, uh, look, you can't look at fascism simply through its 20th century manifestation. It's something far more ancient and widespread than just a sort of Second World War term. We had a similar discussion on this sort of uh, perspective that Erickson has, the one I did on his treatment of uh, culture and all that. I'm not going to rehash the whole cultural relativism thing since we've already done videos on that. But what's relevant to our discussion is that he's committed to portraying that as it exists rather than sweeping savagery, so to speak, 
under the carpet like most writers do and I've mentioned this before but neither does he portray them simply as savages right uh, he always shows us the sophistication and the wisdom in their words as well we do have to note here that Erickson is not a, cu a cultural relativist right so that's yet another box that we shouldn't be dropping him into right another interesting thing is Erickson's portrayal of the political class and of politicians and political figures in general we are constantly reminded whenever we look at politics that uh, politicians on either side of the aisle are sort of the same sniveling sort of self-serving cowards and while you and I might battle each other over our own political causes uh, these people at the top would hug each other at the drop of a hat if it suited them my favorite example of this is when Pearl returns to uh, Lessine and he sees Malik Rel and Kobol Odom there next to her with her and even Pearl is like what the fuck you like you people really suck uh, and this is pretty much consistent with Erickson's portrayal of politicians in general throughout the books the the power hungry bureaucrats in Reaper's Gale for instance are equally shameless equally self-serving in fact if at all there is a political bias in the 10 books it's more of what we would call an anti-political bias. Erickson doesn't really seem to like politicians. Look at how little the lives of ordinary citizens change, no matter who's in power. Look at how uh, the daily life of an ordinary literary citizen, for instance, changes when the Edur takes over. There's essentially no difference. They still have to deal with the same old problems, no matter who sits on that throne. If at all there was a time for Erickson to wave the flag of some pet political or socio-political ideology, it would have been then. But he doesn't do it. What he shows instead is how irrelevant it is for ordinary people. The final thematic issue I'd like to touch on is the whole individualism versus collectivism thing, which was a huge part of Erickson's post as well. This is something which, as we all know, keeps recurring over and over again in the series, uh, whether it's the collectivism of the Aimas against the individualism of the Jagut or the lone cripple god who's collectively ganged up on by a cabal of local gods and ascendants or the final draconic battle where all the dragons start combining into a singular entity called uh, Tiam that's much more than just a sum of its parts. The whole collective individual thing is played with a lot throughout the 10 books. And in cases like the Aimas and the Jago, this turns into political commentary as well, as Erickson mentioned. This dichotomy is what helps him explore so many questions in the books with a tone of neutrality and objectivity. We see the, the brutality of collective cruelty, like the tennis cowrie cannibals in Memories of Ice, we also see the brutality of individual tyrants like Kalo or the Jagut tyrants like, uh, like uh, Rest. We see people like the Bone Hunters who are willing to die to free a god that isn't even theirs, uh, with nobody to witness their monumental sacrifice. And the final battle itself is symbolic, I guess, of Erickson's disdain for labels, right? Where all the founding races cast aside their historical labels and they come together we even see the Jagut and the Aimas fight side by side we see the Jagut fighting in a group rather than as the fiercely individualistic uh, race we've seen them as so far and we see the Aimas regaining their individual humanity that had previously been lost to them to pursue this collective group-based uh, cause interest both races sort of come a full circle and Erickson clearly shows us that despite hundreds of thousands of years, the fate of both races will ultimately not be decided by the socio-political labels that they've placed on themselves and that the world has placed on them. I thought that was a, a pretty sort of cool way to structure it. So what is Erickson's overall political commentary then if he just bashes the left and the right if he just sits in the middle and laughs at both sides uh, with us cheering him on in the background of course right if he just does that and and bashes both sides then what's the point what is he trying to tell us because it's easy to criticize existing claims if you don't have to make one yourself so how would we crystallize Erickson's uh, sort of uh, politics 
I think the answer, once again, is in what Erickson put in that recent post. And I think this encapsulates the entirety of the political commentary in the series. Once again, just my opinion. Erickson said, and I quote, The problem with extreme views comes when a simplistic belief system is imposed on a complicated, nuanced reality. The two don't fit and will never fit. I think this is the perfect one-line answer for what is the point of the political commentary in the uh, Malazan series. You critique both sides, but what is your side? It's this. This is Erickson's side. That reality is complicated and any attempt to impose a singular understanding of it will inevitably fail. You will not just earn Erickson's disdain, you will fail as well. And this is probably why he gets so annoyed when people try to characterize him as uh, left-leaning or right-leaning, because the whole point he's trying to make is that those labels are useless. Erickson firmly believes, or seems to believe in my interpretation, that trying to convey reality through one version is futile. So you can't box him into a school of thought when his entire critique is that schools of thought don't give you the bigger picture, the correct picture. I mean, read the quote again and you will even understand why Erickson as a writer uses the whole unreliable narrator gimmick, right? Let me read that quote again that Erickson put. The problem with extreme views comes when a simplistic belief system is imposed on a complicated, nuanced reality. This is why there's no fixed timeline or reality for the Malazan books. Reality in Erickson's view is too complex for it to be conveyed in a neat little chronological package where all the ends are tied up. That does not happen in real life. You're never going to have a historical timeline without inconsistencies. You're never going to have multiple POVs where everybody's observations align. That's the other thing I hate sometimes with epic fantasy books, right? There are, uh, they have uh, hundreds of POV characters and none of them contradict each other on their timelines and their history. They all have perfectly accurate, consistent historical knowledge and uh, sort of, uh, they all have very neatly tied up, uh, synchronized chronologies of past events. And obviously, the authors of those books do this because they're building the world and they're giving you uh, pieces of a puzzle to put together as readers rather than conveying an actual sense of history or wonder. Other authors give you tidbits of history and information that neatly fit together because they want you to understand the world and the plot, right? The Malazan books, on the other hand, often give you contradictory information, which is how it would be in the real world, right? People lie about their exploits, different cultures have different calendars, so historical events have no fixed uh, timeline that everybody agrees on. What somebody calls the first empire would be entirely different from what someone from another continent would refer to as the first empire, right? So even in his writing style, he emphasizes this, that there is no singular truth that can be captured in a clinical statistical snapshot. Life is too complex for that. History is too complex for that. Politics is too complex for that. And that sort of, uh, that thinking, right, is what ultimately drives Erickson to keep going back to this theme of humanist emotions and compassion for each other. Humanism as a philosophy is probably what describes Erickson's worldview the best, right? Just my interpretation, just my assessment, guys. Uh, I'm not here to tell you that it should be yours as well, by the way. I think Erickson is an old-school humanist and that there's no real way to box that into a modern political category, right? Because uh, they're almost an extinct species among academics and writers and thinkers. Humanism is notorious for being a vaguely defined philosophy to begin with. I'm not even sure if it's still widely taught in uh, Western philosophy, but it's the foundation of Eastern religions like Hinduism and Buddhism. You should, uh, you should read up on humanism as a philosophy if you're interested. It's, uh, it's quite interesting. So Erickson would make a pretty good Hindu or Buddhist, I guess. No real rules to follow, just be a good person, understand other people based on where they stand rather than based on where you stand, right? Uh, uh, things like that. So 
those are the reasons guys uh, the reasons why i think it's uh, pointless to categorize erickson's politics into a label because number one he thematically remains objective throughout the books on the big questions instead of falling prey to the traps that many other western writers fall into number two as a world builder he believes more in presenting a socio politically realistic authentic timeline rather than one that is cohesive simply for the reader's sake and number 3 above all he constantly tries to convey a truth that transcends political questions that have a humanist rather than a political perspective to things so there you have it folks i hope you enjoyed the video i will try to put another one out soon i hope you got something useful out of this in terms of uh, why deciphering Erickson's political allegiance is futile, right? Uh, I will be appearing on Raf's channel sometime in the next couple of days, and we will be discussing political themes in the books as well. So I hope you join me on his channel. Thank you, guys, and I'll uh, I'll see you soon.